Hello and welcome to today's online event titled The Debt Burden, How to Create a Sustainable Debt Management Framework. My name is Karen Strohecker and I'm the Chief Correspondent for Emerging Markets at Reuters. We're here for the launch and uh, the discussion of a new initiative. Um, it comes with a paper co-authored by Rodrigo and Paula looking at how issues surrounding debt can be prevented in the first place rather than having to resolve them when they arise. So with me today presenting the paper is Rodrigo Olivares Caminal, Professor of Banking and Finance Law at the Center of, for Commercial Law Studies at Queen Mary University here in London. Paola Subaki, Professor in International Economics at the Global Policy Institute, also at Queen Mary University of London. To discuss the findings, I'm delighted to welcome three experts who have been through or are currently dealing with the challenges that rising debt burdens pose to economies and countries around the world. With us is Federico Bonaglia, Deputy Director at the OECD Development Center, Yanis Manuel Lides, a partner at Allen and Overy, and uh, Gelsomnia Vigliotti, Director General for International Financial Relations at the Italian Treasury. Of course, this year Italy holds the presidency of the G20 Forum that brings together the world's major economies and where debt is high up on the agenda. There will be a chance for you in the audience to ask questions. We will have at least half an hour at the end to get through as many as we can, so please do put your questions into the chat function. And uh, without further ado, I want to hand over to Rodrigo and Paula now. Karin, thank you very much. Uh, I am going to very briefly uh, introduce the, the initiative and then I will hand over to Paola who will kickstart the presentation. I'm going to keep it very brief and I'm going to, to just highlight that uh, we have initiated this new initiative on good practices in sovereign debt borrowing, where what we are trying to do, we are trying to change the focus, we're trying to change the axis from uh, the ex post restructuring to an ex ante prevention because I think that what we have been seeing lately with the buildup of debt is that we are, we tend to be running from behind, trying to solve the problems. And, and what we are uh, trying to do is uh, we will always be arriving late and having to deal with the debt and the problems that the debt creates is that the, uh, we think that the focus should be on the prevention. It's more about the problem not being generated in the first place rather than seeing how we cure and deal with it. And that's the idea of this initial paper, which is doing a, an overview mapping of what is the current situation and then highlight what we think are the main areas or what are the core problems. And the idea looking forward with, with uh, Professor Paula Subaki, the, the other principal co-investigator is to start looking in in more detail into each one of these areas. But uh, without uh, further ado, I, I hand over to to Paola to see if she would like to add anything on on the overarching view of the initiative and then she will she will start the presentation of the paper. Well, thank you, Rodrigo, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, thank the um, uh, discussants, uh, uh, Gelsomina Vigliotti, Yanis Manuelidis, uh, and, and Federico Bonaglia, and of course, uh, Karin, our chair for today, uh, for your contribution to this uh, project. This is our first paper, and uh, obviously we are a bit nervous to uh, start to uh, disseminate uh, the first result of this project, but it's a project and we think it is very important and is particularly this particular um, time in, uh, in, in, uh, in this crisis. And, and so we are very excited and, and look forward to your comments. And obviously also we are grateful to all, all of you, the participants then, and I hope you will actually contribute with your comments and question to our paper. Um, I need to ask Rodrigo for, a technical, for technical assistance because uh, um, I don't have uh, the presentation loaded on my iPad, but I guess you, you have it. And so maybe you can be the, um, uh, we'll say, 
remote control of this uh, presentation, if you Paola, don't mind. I'll be more than happy. Uh, we were, before the session, we were exchanging uh, who duties and who will be remote controller. And, I'll, and, and I take that with uh, very much pride. So I can write on my slides on the second part of the presentation. Uh, two very minor additional comments. I, I also extend uh, our our thank you to Yanis Manuelides, the, the, the third discussant, and also to the OECD for co-hosting this in collaboration with uh, the Global Policy Institute at the Queen Mary University of London and IGLEF, the Institute for Global Law, Economics and Finance at uh, Queen Mary. So, Paula, I'm going to uh, share my screen uh, and... Uh, and so, Rodrigo, we can show we are a good team and we are able to work remotely and because what they call it is a distributed uh, research. This is the, actually, this is the, the um, uh, first slide. So, um, Rodrigo, if you don't mind to move to the next one, which is the outline and uh, the outline of this paper and the outline of today's discussion. Um, we have already mentioned the key point and the key research question around this uh, uh, this project, which is uh, the uh, ex-ante uh, uh, crisis prevention vis-a-vis -vis the ex-post crisis resolution. Um, what we're going to do, in, and we, we try to demonstrate here why it is important to look at the ex-ante and to be prepared ex-ante and prevent uh, that accumulation uh, as opposed to be uh, prompt, uh, efficient, and good in crisis resolution. And a point we make in our paper is that no matter how orderly the um, uh, crisis resolution is and the debt restructuring that the fault is, it is still a very um, a costly, painful and disruptive pro uh, process. Therefore, it would be better to think about preventing the crisis. And this has been um, in a broader ter term um, and issues then, for example, the G20, the multilateral financial organization have been facing since 2008, since the global financial crisis. So again, the issue about being constantly in a crisis resolution mode as opposed to being in a crisis prevention mode. So in this paper, we try to address the, the question of what makes a good ex-ante debt management framework. Um, so in, in, in the presentation, we will briefly go to present the current state of play and so where we are in terms of debt accumulation and mitigation, mitigating activities. Then we will look at more in detail the crisis prevention versus crisis resolution. And again, we claim then the crisis resolution is somehow the default mode and, and, and pardon me, uh, allow me this uh, sort of linguistic punch, but it's the one which is always and somehow the, 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 the chosen um, uh, 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 measure. And, and then we will discuss uh, the, um, the uh, debt, uh, the ex-ante debt management framework. Can I have this next slide? So when we talk about the recent debt, the, uh, the, looking at the current problem, so, and uh, we know we are on, on, the, on the verge of what could be a, 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 an emerging market debt crisis, and so, and possibly with uh, extensive um, uh, consequences. Um, what, um, so we are actually in a difficult situation right now, but it's not, it's not something that is due exclusively and uh, only and to the uh, COVID crisis. Um, if we go back to February 2020, uh, the, so before the uh, pandemic hit, um, the IMF published in February 2020 um, a report on uh, um, that, uh, the debt situation on uh, uh, low-income country and developing countries and also emerging market economies. And in this report, we read that 36% of 70 uh, low-income countries, poor countries, were at high risk of debt distress or already in debt distress. That was February 2020. So again, example of uh, South Tome and Principe, um, Ethiopia and Kenya, again, countries then took up the um, uh, ambitious uh, 
uh, investment plans, mainly financed by non uh, concessional loans or countries that were hit by the collapse in particularly a country's commodity exporters that were hit by the collapse in commodity prices in the years after the global financial crisis. And the IMF in February 12, 2020 also told us that many emerging market economies were also at significant risk of that distress. So low income countries, high risk already in that distress, emerging markets, uh, significant risk. But that was before the uh, pandemic. And, um, and then obviously the pandemic uh, has pushed and is still pushing that levels to new highs. This is because we have higher spending needs, uh, because countries seek to mitigate the health and economic effect of the crisis. We had falling revenues due to lower uh, GDP growth and trade, high financing costs, particularly for the vulnerable countries that have limited access to external financing. So all in all, we have a rising level um, that uh, burdens. And the pandemic, we need to um, basically exacerbate what we show in this paper, exacerbate an existing critical situation for a number of countries. And, uh, and in particular, the pandemic has affected, and still affecting uh, both solvency and liquidity indicators. And the situation, and you can see here, um, this, this chart shows the uh, critical increase in government uh, um, debt as a, as, a, as a percent of GDP. I must also stress then uh, there are issues around using debt to um, government debt to GDP ratio as an indicator, but this is actually, we use it here, we discuss actually in the paper why it would be better okay. to use other uh, indicator. But anyway, that's not the point. Here, it just to show the trend in uh, debt vulnerabilities. And can I have the next slide, Rodrigo? Um, so um, what we see now then countries and emerging market economy, that's why we are all very concerned about um, a possible uh, debt crisis, extensive debt crisis is because in particular countries that are ex exposed to capital, international capital flows uh, or have uh, a significant percent of the of the debt issued in uh, um, uh, dollars or hard currency, mainly US dollars, they are now um, potentially vulnerable to changes in the um, monetary policy of the United States. Um, and so what we say is countries need to be prepared and need to build up resilience. That's why uh, ex ante. Uh, preventions is main, better than exposed resolution. And what we see in, in, in our analysis, in particular, we focus on Latin America, is then some emerging market development economies that have learned a lesson from previous debt cycles have been more resilient to the current COVID crisis. And in particularly, uh, and this is a chart that shows some uh, 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 Latin American countries, in particularly uh, countries that have uh, um, developed local currency security markets. So they have tried to mitigate or reduce the exposure to hard currency. And so potential uh, um, exchange rate, uh, rate risk um, that will actually uh, aggravate, exacerbate that, that problem. Um, and, um, uh, and so in, in some cases we have been, so Brazil, for example, is a country that has a, a, a high share of uh, local currency debt, is about 90%. On the other hand, in recent years, uh, Brazil has reduced the, um, the uh, duration of its debt. So now it's much more exposed to short-term debt vis-a-vis long-term debt, which is also another reason for, um, uh, for vulnerability. Um, so... Um, this is where we are, and we know that there are some countries that have already um, um, concluded that restructuring, like Argentina and Ecuador, again, pre-existing conditions that were exacerbated during the crisis, and Zambia and uh, Lebanon are still a uh, work in progress. Uh, can, I, can, I, can you move to the next um, um, uh, slide, uh, please? Thank you. So, uh, the response, the policy response, international policy response has been uh, swift and, uh, and, and very 
and very strong, very robust. And, uh, and again, um, I would say it's been even more robust than the one we saw at the time of the global financial crisis. In fact, at the spring meeting of 20, the World Bank and the IMF spring meeting 2020, there was actually agreed to broaden and extend the international financial safety net and in a much broader way compared to the uh, what was decided at the G20 London summit in April 2009, so immediately after the uh, global financial crisis. Um, so about $250 billion were made available for various um, uh, IMF, IMF-led lending facility and then services, um, service relief. And to date, we have $107 million uh, dollars were deployed, have been deployed in uh, total financial assistance for about 85 countries. What is important to understand in this uh, global fund, um, this uh, international safety net is the fact that this is actually a uh, flexible lending facility. So um, already in 2009, the IMF has was um, um, embraced this non-concessional lending emergency lending for countries with good fundamentals, but with temporary uh, liquidity uh, needs. And so, and this again, we have instruments like the rapid financial instruments, RFA and so on. And also there was an extension of this catastrophe containment and relief trust CCRT, which was actually introduced at the time of the Ebola crisis. Um, as part of this response, there were actually also um, several good governance measures, which were devised again to improve and promote accountability and transparency, in particular in the spending of these resources. Um, then the G20, at the time of the, uh, this, um, the spring meetings in uh, April 2020, they uh, agreed to on this uh, debt services suspension initiative. Um, which is basically directed to uh, low-income countries. So it's a suspension of uh, um, debt services. Originally, until the end of 2020, now is until uh, June 2021, but it looks like it will be extended uh, possibly for another year. And then later in 2020, there was this common framework for debt treatment, which was devised in particular to facilitate that restructuring on a case-by-case -case basis and also promote border sharing uh, across uh, uh, various creditors. And that was, again, particularly devised with bilateral creditors in mind, and in particular China, which um, um, is particularly uh, relevant in the case of Africa. So this was the crisis response mode. And as I said, it was good and it was, uh, it was swift and it was robust, but it is actually limited, it's temporary limited, is actually, and can we move to the next slide, and is, um, is mainly um, a patch on the situation which is much more complex. Briefly, this DSSI is partial and temporary, I already said, and is temporary, maybe extended, is in order to be successful, we indicate in the paper that all stakeholders need to take part, in particular the private sector, in particular multilateral lenders, um, we need uh, uh, full dis transparency on data and that, that, that information obviously subject to what I need to be protective for uh, confidentiality and commercial reasons. And then we need a strong commitment to responsible uh, debt management. Can we move to the other slides, please? Um, and the, the common framework is also very interesting, somehow complement the, um, uh, the SSI and uh, is very much ad hoc. And so far we have seen uh, uh, three cases. I got um, Zambia and Angola here, but there's also Chad. It was the first one, first African country to request a, a common framework procedure uh, between the G20 and the Paris Club. Uh, um, and uh, it was somehow an ideal candidate for this common framework because it doesn't have any uh, publicly traded external debt. Zambia is another case, is, was the first Africa country to default uh, during the pandemic and it put that restructure under the common framework. And, and again, Zambia is another case where the, 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 the pandemic, the, the COVID crisis exacerbated pre-existing conditions. And then the third one is Angola, which actually um, is completed a, rene a renegotiation of his debt with China. Uh, and, uh, and again, with the uh, uh, outcomes that you see on the slide. 
Um, so this is all good, but why crisis prevention is better than crisis resolution? And we go to the next slide. Um, as I said, these are the DSSI and the common frameworks are good post uh, exposed solution. Um, they address the problem as we see it. They are emergency solution. They address in particularly the particularly the DSSI a liquidity shortage for poor countries, but they do not actually tackle the underlying uh, reasons for uh, this uh, inability to manage uh, debt. And so they don't tackle overspending, low GDP growth, decline in tax revenues, and so on. And um, there is a lack of transparency that hinders monitor and, pro and proper management and accountability and encourages uh, debt accumulation that is not addressed by none of these uh, uh, um, uh, post ex post measures. And, and also they do not provide a long-term solution to the debt problem. So as I, as I said, they're good patches, but they do not, they, they try to contain the problem. They try to contain the risk coming from that problem, but they do not address the underlying, the underlying causes of the problem. And um, can we um, move up? Sorry, this is uh, um, and no, no, sorry. Can you move back to the, the, the previous slides? And thank you. Um, so um, in our and in the paper, we try to um, uh, show why ex post that restructure is, is onerous and we should avoid it if we can. I mean, once we are in a crisis, of course, we need to address it. But why is onerous and it should be better to avoid as much as we can and really use ex post intervention as literally the last uh, resort. Um, it is onerous and we look at two cases again for Latin America and we look at Argentina and Ecuador uh, versus Peru and Uruguay. And again, to show that um, countries then have learned from past experience in particularly Peru and Uruguay and have put in place a series of good measures, including a good macroeconomic framework, have been much more resilient at the, during this current crisis than countries like Argentina and Ecuador then feel again, are, haven't really managed this, um, the lessons from the past. And, and we look in particularly at Argentina and as, as an example of this short, uh, this uh, um, ex post um, uh, debt restructuring cost. And so again, there are short and medium term costs of emergency measures, there are even political costs, and there are also long term credibility losses that impact on credit history and default premium. And uh, we have an interesting research published by the IMF, specific on Argentina that shows that interest rates on debt issuances between 2016 and 2018 range between 6% and 8%. So what doubles the range that other countries in the region pay for, that, for issuing that debt in the same period. But clearly Argentina is a serial defaulter and therefore this has an impact on the uh, risk premium that, that has to be paid on this on his uh, the issuances. And this is again to, to show then it's it, it, the, the, the cost goes on and is not just the, the immediate short term cost. And plus the, then we have all the legal cost and litigation costs. There is another element we um, emphasize in our paper. Why is now better again, uh, uh, why uh, ex, ex post crisis um, uh, resolution and debt restructure is so onerous. It is because of the complexity that now is due to the shift in credit or composition. And, and, and perhaps, Rodrigo, if you don't mind to move to the next share. And this has been a recent uh, shift in terms of players, um, uh, entities involved, uh, type of creditors, uh, different categories and different, uh, and therefore all these differences impinges on the, uh, comp you know, create a more complexity when it comes to that resolution. And again, we explain in details in the paper. Here, I like to focus on this um, uh, chart because it shows the, uh, uh, rise of China as a, as a bilateral lender. And so China is now an important critical play in any 
on most processes of debt restructuring and debt renegotiation. This chart in particular shows the exposure of some countries in Asia and in Africa, you know, low income countries to China and how much this exposure has grown over the five years between 2014 and 2019. And um, in some cases uh, like uh, uh, Kenya, for example, or Djibouti, these, uh, Djibouti, for example, is the, the, the debt has increased from seven, uh, the debt exposure to, to China has increased from 7.7% .7 to almost 35% in just five years. So again, this is to, to, to show how complex it is now to go into this uh, debt resolution uh, mode. Um, and now give the floor to Rodrigo for uh, discussing and presenting our thinking around this ex ante uh, debt management framework. Thank you, Paola. Thank you very much for that tour de force on what is the the landscape out there, the macro data. But I'm going to go uh, on a very simple uh, analysis of debt. And basically, I would like to put here at the center uh, the state and and basically what that uh, what that what is the role here of the state and how that has a, a direct impact on, on, on the financing, right? And we have the state uh, at, the, at the center and, and the state uh, has to provide some essential services. We have to do with uh, education, security, justice, health, the essential services are provided by the state. And, and the state can uh, face a budgetary deficit to provide the essential services. Why? Because these services are costly and money is needed to provide them effectively and without interruption. And, and again, uh, I think that there's no may, need to make reference that if that this usually is the problem in normal times with COVID-19, this problem is exacerbated, but again, Paola and I, we think that the, the COVID has not, be, it's not the cause of the problem. It's basically something that has exacerbated the problem. And, and the usual options are either taxation or debt financing, right? Taxation, you have, a, in theory, unlimited taxing powers. However, it is in reality limited to the economic base and may not be enough for long-term capital intensive initiatives. And what we also need to bear in mind is that a, this usually applies uh, direct over economic activity within the territory. And, and this will have, a, in the long term, it can have a deleterious effect if less productive than the use of the private sector. On the debt financing, and here, uh, what we need to bear in mind is that debt financing today, as it stands, is, it's not equity. And what we need to bear in mind on the debt financing is issues of official sector versus private sector. Uh, and I'm sure we, we will come back to this, but for example, some of, of, of the initiatives that we are seeing now as part of the solution, like uh, DSI or Common Framework, they expect participation of private sector, but they are not being involved in the whole discussion. So basically th th there is a natural tension between the different types of financing. Then you have the loan market versus capital markets. And again, this has to do with issues that we will discuss briefly, like transparency because loans tend to be uh, more secretive while the capital markets, due to the information that needs to be disclosed to investors, they are, they are way more transparent. The other issue that we need to bear in mind is the intergenerational element in the sense that money being borrowed today will be paid by uh, a future generation. And then we have risks which are either endogenous or exogenous and also uh, debt sustainability, whether uh, debt to GDP uh, ratio is a real proxy. And, and, and here I cite two examples, Ecuador with 27% debt to GDP ratio that defaulted opportunistically in 2010, or Nicaragua with a 236 debt to GDP ratio they didn't default. So what we need to bear in mind, debt to GDP ratio tends to usually be a good proxy, but it's not bulletproof. And then the other thing which is very important and one of, of the issues on which we would like to focus within this research initiative is the real need of financing versus the political bias, that sometimes uh, money is borrowed without having the real need for, for that 
uh, borrowing. And this is a slide that, that I, I, I like very much, and, and I'm not going to go into detail, but what I'm trying to showcase here is uh, in one single snapshot, what is uh, the current landscape, right? And basically what you have here is we have, a, we can divide this, this slide uh, in two, and, and let me change, uh, and basically you can divide this here in two, and what you have here is on one side official sector and on the other side private sector. And then you can also draw a horizontal line here, which is basically this is, how to incur the debt, this is the incurrence, and this is basically the, the restructuring of the debt. And you have here at the bottom a sovereign debtor that needs to access either official sector financing or private sector financing. Here you have the multilaterals, the bilaterals, commercial bank debt and private sector debt, mainly euro bonds. You can claim commercial bank, it's also, also private, but basically this is to distinguish between uh, loans and bonds. And you know how this operates, usually under conditionality and Article 4 annual consultations. Bilateral is under, if this operates under Paris Club, this would be uh, under uh, information sharing, comparability of treatment, and subject to an IMF program. But what we have to highlight is that now we are, we are having a new subset of uh, bilateral lenders, uh, where Paola was referring to China before, but it's not just China. There are others as well that are entering this market and, and are not traditional uh, parties club bilateral lenders. And here where we have is the general contractual terms where uh, we have what I call the plain vanilla terms. These are standard terms that you will come across pretty much on all international financial arrangements. Of course, there will be specific provisions for syndicated loans or euro bonds, but uh, these are pretty much standard clauses that you will expect to come across. Or what I refer here as the, the more funky stuff, these are the slightly more esoteric terms that you will have find in a specific bond issuances. On the restructuring side, what you have is a IMF that basically you don't have a, a face value reduction because this creates moral hazard. There have been exceptions with the HIPIC initiative or, or rollover, but, but this tends to be a very rare exception. On the bilateral uh, front, what we have is a Paris Club treatment that this is determined on a per capita and debt ratios, and there are different terms applicable to, to Paris Club debt. Uh, but then what we have is what we are going to do with the new entrants, with the new players, and what are the roles that they will be playing by. And that's where basically is here where we need to start thinking of the common framework, basically that the common framework will start playing a key role uh, in this respect. And when we talk about commercial, what we have is London Club, that they deal on an ad hoc basis with a bilateral commercial bank debt. And then on the bonds, what we have is what has been the latest uh, tool to deal with bonded debt has been the use of collective action clauses. But as we know, not all bonds have collective action clauses or they have some collective action clauses that do not allow aggregation. And, and that's why sometimes we will still see the old school voluntary exchange offers, give me an old bond, I will give you a new bond, but with worse financial and economic terms. But this is just to kind of uh, map everything to know where we are because uh, then, and this is getting slightly into more specific examples. And, and I just pick the one on, on, on Mozambique, but uh, at the bottom of this slide, you also have other examples of a uh, less transparent scenarios. But basically the one on Mozambique is, it's, I think, a well-known by now, and, and I think that this is kind of a textbook example, where there were these uh, three loans incurred by uh, state-owned enterprises, uh, MAM, Proindicus, and Ematum, state-owned enterprises, they enter into these three loans. These two were undisclosed, so they were hidden liabilities, and the Ematum, 
uh, basically that they took a loan to build a tuna fishing fleet. Then this was convert, converted in loan participation notes. Uh, all of these three loans were uh, guaranteed by the central government. And then uh, what happened with the, these loan participation notes, then they were converted into a euro bond. This was, remember, it was already guaranteed by the sovereign. So what you have here is uh, this one, which has been publicly disclosed and these two which have not been publicly disclosed. And out of the sudden, basically the liabilities on the balance sheet of Mozambique kind of doubled. And then what we have exposed is the situation still has not been uh, uh, regularized and there's a extensive ongoing litigation at the moment in London. And, and, and my concern behind all, all of this is not just the lack of transparency, but, but Mozambique is a perfect textbook case study because it was whether there was a need of incurring the loan in the first place, whether due process has been followed because the, the one, some of the issues that are being questioned at least domestically is that those that acted in uh, incurring the loan were acting beyond the constitutional powers of the country. And then the third issue is elements of uh, corruption. And uh, then this, this even touches up on issues of transparency, whether that debt was properly disclosed or not. And again, uh, I would like to, to sector out the Ematum bonds because those were transparent from the outset. They appear in a... Uh, in IMF Article 4 consultation. So they were transparent from the outset. Uh, whether people were, were conscious about them or not, that's a different issue, but those were transparent. And, and on top of that, then remember that here that these were listed and, and these were fully listed as well. But these are the ones which are slightly more controversial. And again, here you have other examples from Ecuador, South Africa, etc. So basically it's not just an isolated phenomenon. Uh, and then we have the same issues ongoing at the moment, for example, in Venezuela with the PDVSA 2020. But uh, just to, to try to conclude, because basically I, I'm more keen in, in listening to the discussions about the comments that they have, uh, usually in, in these scenarios, what we have are issues of uh, solvency and issues of liquidity, right? Uh, can a sovereign go insolvent? Uh, the answer is no. They cannot go insolvent because they have, uh, in theory, uh, they can increase taxes, property sales, expropriate, dispose of assets. So basically, a sovereign cannot go insolvent. However, if they have liquidity issues, what we need to look at is whether there are medium to long term rooted on structural problems, which will then will need. Uh, some kind of uh, restructuring, and this is where probably the common framework can come into the equation of if there are temporary short-term triggered by a, a shock, and that's where probably this DSSI can play a role, or even considering in the inclusion of a interest holiday provisions in the instruments at the moment of issuance. And an interest holiday provision at the moment of issuance will allow to replicate pretty much what DSSI is trying to do, but on a contractual basis. Uh, but if it's a medium to long-term rooted problem, then the issue is uh, whether the common framework is, could be a way forward. But, but what I said before is one of the big uh, weaknesses of both, uh, in my, my view, DSSI and the common framework is the lack of the involvement of the private sector. But why uh, the private sector doesn't want to get involved? The private sector acknowledges that they need to be part of the solution and they need to be there to finance the recovery because I don't, I'm not sure whether uh, the official sector will be able to finance the ex, uh, the, the ex post COVID recovery in the entire world. And that's why the private sector can play a very important role. But with the the approach of DSSI and common framework, you are, I, I sense that indirectly in some instances, it's naming and shaming and pushing away the private sector because they have not been involved in the design. 
they have not been involved in the consultations and this is usually presented to them as a fait accompli to sign on a dotted line after everything has been agreed. Uh, so what we are saying here with our paper or our research is that we need to focus on three aspects. The first one is the due process. The, there needs to be a law and economic analysis of whether there's a need for new debt, uh, whether that contributes to development and, and what are the future prospects of this project. And here we need to also look at uh, how the debt is being incurred. At the moment we have uh, three live matters or actual litigation on the validity of the incurrence of the debt, which is Mozambique that I briefly explained, uh, Ukraine versus the law of venture that's originated on the loan granted by Russia to Ukraine, which uh, is coming up with the Supreme Court here in the UK, and also the ongoing litigation in the US regarding the PDVSA 2020 bonds. A second issue has to do with transparency, and here it's about uh, holding people accountable, having proper recording, uh, budgeting, but this has also, it's not just transparency, but also this has to do with uh, these two, uh, pillars one and two, build on what is the debt management exercise, because uh, if you have good pro process with uh, and proper transparency with reporting, budgeting, etc. All this contributes to a, a more efficient debt management and also to be able to civil society, uh, Congress slash parliament, individuals be able to held people accountable. And, and third is the, the important role of the rule of law. Why? Because uh, in the aftermath of some of the recent scandals, we are trying to use uh, certain principles or, or the law of other jurisdictions to help people accountable. But, but basically what we need to do is we need to fight opportunism and we need to fight corruption. And, and for that, we need the rule of law. And we cannot blame on the the poor structuring of the contracts or of lenders granting a loan to something that had been signed off by the Ministry of Finance because, for example, that has not followed due process. Why? Because according to the jurisdiction, there was. But the issue is the ostensible authority and 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 the appearance that that has in the eyes of a third party. And that's why uh, the rule of law, and, and on this one, it's a lot has to do with capacity building uh, across jurisdictions to be able to help people accountable. And I think that I will just uh, leave it there. And uh, probably, I think that uh, I, I should probably hand over to Karin uh, so she can uh, now moderate uh, the discussions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rodrigo. Thank you, Paula. That was really interesting. Um, great overview, although not the most optimistic outlook at this point when it comes to the state of play. Um, I want to bring in Frederico from the policymaking side. What, when, when, when you look at the current state of play and how we can maybe prevent this in future, um, uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges and the biggest obstacles we'll have to overcome? Federico, I think you're on mute. Okay, I'm not sure if Federico can hear me at this stage. Um, so Karin, maybe... I, yes, I think that he, is, uh, yes. he seems to be having technical issues. Probably, uh, I don't know, probably yes. you can go to I was the... Just... I'm yeah. going to hand over to Yanis then. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Yanis. Um, you're coming from the legal perspective uh, to all of this. You've had uh, um, lots of experience. What do you think um, are the biggest challenges from a legal side uh, on this process of designing a better architecture so we can prevent this? 
Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you for the question. So um, I think if I can just comment generally on the paper, it's still, even though it wants to shift the focus on prevention, it still very much uh, focuses a lot on, uh, on what went wrong and some current problems. And I think that that is, uh, uh, that, that, that in my mind, you know, you, you, you still need to shift a little bit the focus more on the prevention. But to just answer more on, on what is uh, on the current problems, I think what we still lack and the, uh, is, is a proper uh, process for resolving um, uh, insolvencies. Um, the G20 common framework, I think, will be a big challenge because it has, it's basically an attempt to revamp the old Harris Club uh, uh, process, but with uh, um, now with the new bilateral creditors, particularly China. Um, but it, it is it is going to be very important to see who is going to run the process, in particular, uh, uh, given the, uh, the the preponderance, the size of the Chinese presence, whether they will want to run the process, uh, as opposed to uh, allowing the old, old Paris Club secretary. That's a big question to me uh, and needs to be answered. Uh, and then you know, the overall, uh, how exactly this process is going to be used to put transparency uh, and uh, disclosure and all the other things, that, the very good things that it says, uh, how, how this will be done in uh, a process that will have legitimacy uh, and integrity. And through that will be, will, will compel uh, uh, participants to, to, uh, uh, to come in. And so I, I think that that is sort of the big, big issue. But to, 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 insofar as the countries themselves are concerned, my big question to them, if I could sort of ask, uh, and I, I, it's a bit, um, uh, well, we have some, a, a treasury official, but you know, um, some hypothetical country, uh, I would just say, uh, how, how do you use the opportunity now where you can sort of blame a lot of things on the pandemic for, for the faults? How can you use this uh, to rebuild uh, what the economists have called a credible commitment. How do you ensure that you project long-term confidence in how your economy will grow and what tools you have? I have a couple of ideas on this and we can come back to that, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and allow the others to uh, comment. Yeah, so Mina, do you, do you want to come in? That's a, a question that's very relevant to you. How do you see uh, the opportunity, how, how can we rebuild a credible architecture? Um, thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, event, the presentation of this paper, which uh, actually is very at the center of our G20 work uh, uh, this year. Um, you know that, uh, you know, the debt vulnerabilities of uh, of uh, the low-income countries were at the very center of the G20 agenda for some years because actually there was this uh, increasing uh, trend uh, which Paula highlighted uh, before uh, with uh, with this uh, um, you know changing composition of um, of creditors and also uh, debt instruments and uh, actually uh, you know the increasing part of debt already before the crisis uh, uh, raised concern and uh, this concern uh, became much uh, more relevant uh, in, uh, in the course of the crisis because you know in the end uh, what we assisted it was something uh, similar to what happened within our uh, advanced economies uh, eco uh, advanced economies uh, where you know uh, many firms uh, had uh, liquidity problems and uh, for, uh, you know, uh, um, establishing if uh, that liquidity problem uh, will become a solvency problem, you have to ensure that, uh, um, you know, these institutions, these countries have the opportunity to, you know, to bridge uh, the, the emergency situation and to really understand, uh, you know, if uh, there is a sustainability or an you know, sustainability issue. So that's why I think that the debt services uh, suspension initiative uh, has been uh, useful, has been useful, I mean, to tackle uh, the emergency um, the emergency crisis where uh, countries uh, actually encountered, uh, um, you know, growing concern in, uh, uh, in uh, paying their uh, dues um, to, to the debt. But actually, we know that uh, this uh, can, uh, since the very beginning, it was intended to be a temporary, a temporary measure. So, I mean, uh, and uh, to have time to, 
to tackle with the, the debt issue in a more structural way and to identify also, um, you know, I think that uh, a point made by Yanis, which is uh, very much relevant, how to ensure that, uh, you know, sustainably uh, these countries can, uh, can finance their needs, that actually um, these needs are becoming uh, uh, huge. And uh, in this regard, uh, you know, there was uh, the development of the common framework, uh, uh, which is true that it's uh, an exercise that try to put within uh, the uh, Paris Club rules also uh, known uh, traditional creditors like China, but others like Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia and other uh, you know, Paris Club uh, creditors. Um, along some lines, which, which actually um, repeat what the Paris Club rules are, but at the same time that, uh, you know, had to, had to be negotiated with all uh, these other countries. And, uh, you know, um, now with, the, you know, the first uh, meetings that we hope uh, will uh, come very soon of the creditors committee, we will be able to test the validity of, uh, of this uh, experiment. And um, it's also very important, as Yanis uh, said, uh, uh, who will sit uh, on, uh, on, the, on the chair, at the chair of these uh, tables. What we know is that uh, France as a, a you know, secretariat of the Paris Club will also, will always be there. But we also know that China is uh, in, in, a, in an important uh, internal uh, consultation process, uh, you know, to sit uh, on this table with the, the uh, negotiating capacity. And, uh, you know, what we expect from uh, uh, this exercise uh, is uh, something important, and that is uh, the involvement of the private sector. Um, for many reasons, the involvement of the private sector within the SSI didn't, uh, didn't happen. In the end, it was just uh, for the uh, official creditors to participate there. And uh, I want just to, to say one word about what Paula said about the multilateral uh, participation in the DSA society and the common framework. There was a needed debate about the involvement of the multilaterals within uh, the debt initiatives. And um, China insisted a lot for having them there. But the issue is that, um, you know, to, to face with the, the crisis, uh, you know, um, it, it was immediately uh, clear that uh, the financing needs of these uh, countries we will not uh, uh, wouldn't have been uh, um, eliminated by just uh, that treatment, but, but that additional financing was required to, 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 to meet the, the financing needs of the future. So in this regard, you know, um, actually it was uh, considered that it was much better for the multilaterals to provide net uh, fresh money instead of providing that, uh, that relief. Uh, you know, in the, the multilaterals rely very much on their uh, referred creditor status, on their uh, triple A rating. And actually in the end, uh, what was considered much more appropriate, it was to safeguard this uh, creditor status of the multilaterals and so that they were ready to provide uh, uh, fresh money uh, when it was necessary. So this is, uh, you know, to make short uh, a, long, uh, a long story, uh, you know, the process has, uh, has just started and uh, we have to see how uh, actually practically the common framework can work. But I also agree with the very objective of uh, this research, you know, that it's a prevent, it's better than cure. And uh, actually restructuring can be a very complex uh, um, and costly uh, exercise. While you know preventing uh, uh, sustainab unsustainability of debt, uh, it's uh, uh, very much more relevant uh, work. And in this regard, you know, I agree with all uh, what was proposed in terms of what can uh, uh, the, the rule of law, what the um, you know the accounting standards, what the transparency can do to avoid that uh, countries run uh, in uh, unsustainability. And actually, you know, we should be very well aware of what happened after the APIC initiative. In the end, it was, a, you know, one of the most relevant initiatives to, to give a relief, debt relief uh, to, to many countries. And actually, after 10 years, after more 20 years, we ended up with, uh, you know, such a sustainable uh, situation. 
and uh, and why we know you know that, that the, the slides are presented by uh, Paola were very clear about what happened during uh, these 20 years so it's very important that when countries enter within uh, contracts they exactly know what they are going to sign that uh, their legal and uh, um, administrative uh, system are able to you know to manage the flow of uh, and to recognize the flow of funds uh, which they receive and also that management, especially coming from a country like Italy, I can testify how relevant is having good uh, debt management. I do not want to longer, maybe I already talked uh, too much, but happy to come back uh, on, on these other issues. Thanks very much, Samina. <clears throat> Federico, just coming back to you, there's a lot about international coordination, about international cooperation. At the OECD, you're right at the heart of that. How, how do you see this? Topic developing going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karin. And apologies, uh, I had a little uh, fiber, internet fiber problem, so I disconnected for a, for a couple of minutes. Now, first of all, let me thank um, Paul and Rodrigo for the opportunity of joining this panel and uh, the two uh, distinguished uh, discussions. Uh, I, I wanted to make uh, maybe three points um, in my quick uh, reaction to, to the presentation and to the paper. Um, and of course, stress the, the element that you have just said, uh, Karin, about international uh, cooperation. So um, I will start by saying why I think that this paper and this research program that Paola and Rodrigo um, have put together is very important and timely. Then I would like to stress some um, um, aspects related to why it is important that the international community enhances collaboration and integrates the ex-ante and the exposed elements in, in the approach that Gelsomina, for example, has just uh, um, uh, depicted to us. And third, I would like to stress um, the fact that there are considerations that need to be made also in terms of uh, debt management tools uh, that um, exist but are not necessarily um, being fully, uh, fully used or fully uh, Utilize. So, first point about why this is important and timely. Well, important, I think that we all agree that uh, developing countries have entered this crisis uh, in a very uh, vulnerable situation. And what we are observing now is that the seesaw between the needs that they need to fulfill and the resources that they available, that they have uh, available to, to address those needs is clearly uh, opening up. So there is a seesaw effect here. Uh, where on one end the crisis being both supply and demand has uh, compressed the, the revenues uh, of these countries. And on the other hand, uh, in addition to the many development priorities that they had to uh, face with, uh, they are confronted with new uh, expenses, new expenditures related to the mitigation and the response to the pandemic and to the crisis. So just to give a few uh, numbers in addition to what we heard, if you look at the most important source um, of financing for development, which is uh, domestic resource mobilization, taxation, if you compare the situation in Africa, Latin America, and the OECD, you can clearly see um, a wide vari um, variation of, um, of situation within regions. But if you just look at the average of this region, you also see the, the quite staggering figure. Uh, in Africa, uh, we have about 16% of tax to GDP ratio compared to 23% in Latin America, which compares to 34 point something, 0.3, 0.4% .3 in OECD. So we are clearly starting from the pre-COVID situation with a widely different situation. And of course, uh, if you cannot tax, you need to borrow. So the issue of uh, accessing uh, financial markets is and will be uh, even more important as we move out from the crisis. And if you look at what um, developing countries have done to respond to the crisis, this is clearly not commensurable to what OECD countries have done. Uh, I just quote here some numbers from the uh, IMF, but if you look at the, the average um, demand supporting packages that developing countries, low income ones, have put together, on average, this is about 2% of GDP. So the leaks, 2%. The middle income is about 6%. If you look at the higher income uh, economy, is 24% of GDP. So we have a factor of 10 between the low income and the high income in terms of the uh, size of the fiscal of the demand supporting measure put in place. So this is why I think that this discussion today is particularly important. Why is also timely? Well, it happens, it so happens that today, exactly at the same moment that we are speaking, the United Nations is having a discussion about how to deal with the debt legacy. 
and the paper has just been released. Uh, and I, I read the title because I think that it's telling. Uh, the paper is called uh, Liquidity and Debt Solutions to Invest in the SDGs. The Time to Act is Now. If you read the title, it's about liquidity and debt solutions, which is, of course, important. And if you look at the different recommendations that are listed in this paper, many of them um, relate to what to do after. So what to do in terms of resolution of problems. There are some issues that are related to the ex ante, but I would say relatively few. So I think that the discussion that we're having here today is very timely and important because developing countries will inherit a huge debt legacy. And the discussion in the UN context is moving in the right direction, but I think that it's still a bit ignoring this important component. Why is it ignoring? Because I think that we know quite little. So let me move to my second point and I will be um, uh, faster in this respect. If you look at what has happened in the past, um, and I think that historical perspective are quite important, uh, we have learned a lot uh, from the debt crisis of uh, Latin America. We have uh, learned a lot from the Eurozone. And I think that uh, one of the lessons that is uh, rightly emphasized in the paper that Paola and Rodrigo are working on is that um, um, the macroeconomic situation, the transparency about the debt situation, uh, the uh, intergenerational dimension, uh, uh, the, uh, were all elements that were not adequately taken into account in the uh, build-up of the crisis. And so if we want to avoid that the expansion of debt that we inevitably happen uh, results in a future crisis, we need to put more attention uh, to those elements. And uh, uh, what I would like to suggest maybe to, to Paolo, Paola and Rodrigo going forward is that in, in their approach, what I see um, not developed enough um, is the question of looking not only at the, uh, if you want, um, legal institutional aspects related to the prevention, but also suggesting that there is um, some, some um, structural uh, factors uh, that somehow they touch upon when they discuss about commodity volatility, uh, volatility and export, uh, and, and the ups and downs in export. But basically, you have vulnerability in the economic structure that may be a very good predictor of uh, whether you end up in a crisis afterward. And so if we, if we want to focus on the prevention rather than the cure, um, due consideration should be given to what countries should, be do, should, should do to reduce this structure of vulnerability that is often related to productive structures that are not diversified enough or to governance of certain actors in the economy. And I come to the uh, state-owned enterprise here that maybe are not transparent enough. So in the discussion of, the, of this ex-ante framework, I will stress um, the issue of what kind of vulnerabilities can be identified ex-ante and what are the appropriate measures to, do, to deal with those vulnerabilities. Some are related to debt management, some others are not. Among those that are related to debt management, I think that the evidence that Rodrigo presented us shows the increasing role that state-owned enterprises in developing countries or strange, I mean, different types of vehicles are taking. And this is the other flip side of the increased complexity of the debt panorama, the debt landscape, where you have less Paris Club members, more non-concessional laws, more private actors, and among the private actors, private creditors, you have um, big institutional investors. But the flip side is also that on the on the borrowing side, uh, you have much more complex vehicles that have emerged in developing countries. So um, uh, state-owned enterprises, corporate governance uh, should also be uh, an aspect that uh, feeds into this discussion. And then the third and last point that I wanted to make is that, and I'm sorry, it's, uh, also on the second point, uh, something that may be added in the ex-ante part. Uh, the paper focuses a lot on the domestic aspect of the ex-ante, but I think that there is value, there is merit in also looking at the international aspect of the ex ante. So uh, what kind of um, um, processes are put in place in the international uh, financial architecture to support countries in better monitoring the accumulation of debt and the type of debt? And what is been doing, um, um, what is the role of, for example, rating agencies uh, in working together with governments and ensuring that there is no downgrade if a country, for example, uh, is forced or needs to access some kind of debt suspension or, or debt treatment um, clauses. And so um, let me move to my third and final point, which is very quick. Um, and Rodrigo already mentioned it in his presentation. 
Uh, there are a number of instruments, um, contingency clauses, uh, collective action clauses, that uh, have been used in a number of uh, debt contracts. And I think that this is an important aspect that for developing countries has not been fully explored yet and should be uh, more explored. So having an initiative, an international initiative, where countries can also share good practices in debt management would be part of this external part of the example that I think the, the uh, paper could explore more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Federico. We've got some questions from the audience. Um, so the first one goes to Yanis. Yanis, um, what are, give us your top three ideas on uh, the proper process for prevention here. Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, let me let me just say that what uh, you know th this whole discussion about how we're going to resolve the problems today, uh, you know, are all very good and all, all the points made are, are very good. What to me is, is is extremely important, also for the Cromwell framework to succeed, is to put the entity that is really important at the center, and that is the debtor country. And a lot of, uh, and it's the debt of country that has to project what I called earlier, the credible commitment. And it is, uh, it is only if they can do that in, in, in a, with the help of all the uh, stakeholders, of course, but if they can do it, uh, they can uh, mobilize uh, creditors to participate and in fact to reinvest. Because as somebody said before, the crisis we're facing today is not just one of understandable debt somewhere, but uh, the huge need for new money. Uh, to redirect the economies and 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 to 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 uh, get the potential that many of these have. So what what would I focus on? I would focus first of all on, you know, the uh, quality of institutions, uh, uh, and that means a certain uh, independence uh, or quality of staff, uh, uh, pro projecting the idea that these institutions are valid notwithstanding changes of government. And I would start with a debt management agency uh, uh, and that. Um, and I would, uh, and certainly central bank. Uh, I mean, we saw recently with certain countries intervening uh, with the governance of uh, central banking and uh, what, uh, what catastrophic sort of consequences it has in the re reaction in the markets. So it cre clearly projecting uh, our credibility and the independence and quality of institutions is very important. Uh, second, I would say that it is it's extremely important to um, uh, to uh, to take control themselves of the narrative of the development. So in the common framework and indeed on all uh, IMF rescues at the center central of it is the death sustainability analysis the IMF makes, which was always a, an IMF tool. It was there to uh, show to the IMF how its debt was going to be repaid. Uh, and so it had a, always a very short horizon. It's extremely important for the country itself to take over the narrative and be able to show how long term uh, it can benefit the various constituencies, or, you know, all, all, all its investors. Uh, and I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, uh, so the, the, the next one that I think it needs to do is it needs to show how it can strengthen the domestic uh, uh, capital and, and debt markets. Um, and that is actually, I think, a point made earlier by, by, by Rodrigo. Countries that uh, um, show more resilience are the countries that have more developed uh, markets. I mean, it's very simple. You know, if I cannot trust my banks to put my money, I will try to get, uh, or my currency, I will try to get dollars and put it in a, in a foreign bank. Uh, and if I'm then a company, I can only find their credit in this foreign bank. So I'll always be dependent at the original. I won't be able to get rid of the original. So that's, it's very, very important to, to seek to develop that. And again, uh, a backbone of that is 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 uh, institutions. It seems to me. Uh, um, what I would also do is something that's not really discussed very well: the public wealth. Uh, and that's not, um, you know, it was discussed in the context of uh, 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 state-owned enterprises, but more more broadly, countries on the uh, currently just think of uh, either very specific um, uh, project financings or of privatizations. Uh, I think there's another way of thinking about this more globally is to think of how would the country manage its assets if it were a long-term uh, private equity fund. Uh, I will all put them together and put long-term professional management and try to earn dividends rather than just selling them off. Uh, and uh, there are lots of examples of countries who have done that very successfully. Singapore, I think, is, is probably the, the most important example. There are other examples. Um, and you know, we have in Europe we have worked. I've worked on a project like that 
commissioned by the Eurogroup uh, for Greece, unfortunately not really implemented. But uh, the, the idea is there. And the beauty of this is that, again, uh, because it's long term, because it seeks to develop the, the assets, it it helps in this virtual circle uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the long-term credible commitment. And the last thing that I would, uh, um, um, again, it's one of my uh, personal sort of hobby horses, is uh, um, state contingent and particularly GDP-linked bonds. Now, uh, the, the GDP-linked bonds, uh, which fluctuate both, uh, the principal fluctuates uh, um, uh, and the interest fluctuates on nominal GDP uh, are, behave like equity instruments for a sovereign. Why is this, why are they important? Because the sovereign will have to make disclosures about its economy, which is going to be a lot more uh, in depth and a lot more granular. Uh, and, and therefore it will allow all investors to have a much better view. Second, because it will help price the, uh, uh, um, the debt instrument uh, much better. Um, because if I, if, if, uh, if, if my equity is not going very well, well, the debt, you know, the, the debt people will ask a greater cost. And equally, if my debt is uh, if long term, my GDP is going to grow, uh, I, can, I can push the uh, debt yields down. And so if I have uh, something of that sort, then, uh, as a, uh, then maybe I can think of, of some innovative solutions to restructure my current debt. And that is not necessarily going to be in a coercive manner, but it can be as part of a, of a big sort of liability management exercise, the sort of thing that I think Mongolia did uh, a little while ago, and which I hope will be done using, again, some uh, innovative uh, methods. Uh, I know the IMF is working on something, um, on some auction uh, sort of mechanism, but if one could replicate sort of a wide auction mechanism for almost all creditors, that would be very good. So I hope that sort of answers uh, the questions. A lot of ideas that are happy to discuss anyone uh, more in particular. Thanks very much. Um, so Mina, I wanted to ask you, there's, there's been another question about uh, from the audience about the role China and the US are playing. And it's been alluded before about how the, the whole structure of the creditors has changed a lot, which makes debt restructurings now more complicated. Um, but possibly could also help or hinder future resolutions, the mechanisms. What do you think, what should those big creditors, what role should they play in coming up with a new architecture that will help prevent debt problems? What are the conversations you're having in the framework of the G20 at this point on this? Um, thank you very much. Um... Karin, um, actually, this is a quite a complex uh, uh, question, but um, also part of the solution of, of the problem. We all know that uh, China is uh, one of the biggest uh, creditors to uh, low-income countries, and especially uh, in Africa, and not being part of uh, uh, the Paris Club, it's a uh, it's complicated, um, you know, the picture, and um, especially when uh, when uh, you come to you know um, to, to to that treatment. Even if we have to recognize that uh, you know some progress have been achieved, also in this regard, since China um, it's an observer to the Paris Club, so um, at least is uh, the country is trying to uh, customize what. Uh, what are the rules there but you know that the most important uh, uh, you know contribution can come through the um, through the common framework which actually it was the G20 initiative to involve all the non-Paris club uh, um, creditors within uh, uh, the debt treatment uh, uh, case and in this regard, the fact that, uh, you know, there is a common framework which um, um, describe what are the principles according to which, uh, you know, the debt treatment uh, can occur is uh, definitely uh, an important step forward for uh, um, ensuring that, uh, you know, the whole world community uh, can uh, uh, positively uh, contribute uh, on, uh, on this important agenda. Um, 
there are many issues uh, to be uh, to be settled. Uh, the transparency of data it's uh, it's one of the of the major issue also there is this uh, um, issue of the reconciliation of data between uh, creditors and uh, and debtors and uh, so you know what actually is needed is a close co collaboration between uh, both sides and uh, actually um you know, also the World Bank and uh, yeah, the IMF are doing uh, uh, an important job to, to try to have, uh, um, you know, the most uh, uh, relevant data from the credit side. And also within the G20, uh, we have already an initiative that as Italian presidency, we want to further push forward, uh, uh, which is this uh, sample assessment on, uh, on the credit side, where uh, you know, the, the creditors uh, uh, will uh, verify what are uh, their practices in providing uh, uh, financing to, to low-income countries. Not all countries adhered, but, um, you know, we see within uh, the Chinese world uh, some movements in this regard. We know that it's uh, uh, China is a com as a complex uh, um, system, internal system of, of governance that, uh, you know, on the creditors, uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult to, uh, you know, to have a, um, a clear reconciliation among uh, who are the, the private creditors and who are the uh, official creditors. Uh, the process can take time, but um, I think that uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can achieve uh, uh, progress. On the transparency side, on the U.S. side, you know, this was a, a very important uh, pillar for many years under the old administration, but also under the, the new uh, U.S. administration. Uh, you know, the transparency on data and the debt agenda is something uh, which is uh, relevant, but this is something very relevant to the, to the whole uh, uh, world community because you know in the end the vulnerabilities in uh, the low-income countries is something which can have a uh, huge repercussions on uh, on the ad advanced world and the emerging markets as well so you know i think that is one of the uh, of the challenge for uh, the um, whole international community and uh, in particular now where uh, on top of the debt vulnerabilities uh, we, we know that the, the financing needs of these countries are very much uh, uh, increasing and in this regard as others said you know the, um, the official uh, the official creditors cannot uh, be able to fill uh, these gaps we need the involvement of the private sector. We need the involvement of institutional investors and, uh, you know, to attract investors, to attract, uh, um, you know, institutional investors. You have to invest in, uh, in transparency, in uh, good institutions, uh, in uh, improving uh, your accountability. As I was uh, trying to, to say before, you know, I started working in the Italian tre treasury more than 30 years ago. And uh, actually, I went through all other forms of the debt management. And actually, um, you know, actually, they, I mean, independently if you have a, an independent agency or if you have debt management within the government, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, the debt management is uh, pushed through um, some uh, specified uh, rules with uh, uh, dedicated uh, um, and very skilled people is something very much uh, uh, relevant because I mean if you lengthen your uh, your maturities, uh, if you have a domestic debt, uh, if you have a primary market, if you have a secondary market, uh, if you uh, widen the you know the, the array of instruments that you can uh, issue, uh, if uh, you are under a constant review of the rating agencies, if you uh, rely on the accounting standards uh, uh, by international organization, uh, be it Eurostat or the or the uh, SSDI initiative by the uh, IMF or, or the uh, or the OECD. I think these are all relevant uh, issues that uh, uh, will uh, ensure you can uh, continue to have uh, access to markets and continue to have access to markets even under, you know, um, difficult uh, situation. And I very much agree with the point made by by Yanis about the relevance of uh, uh, the development of capital markets and domestic uh, markets, you know, uh, to avoid also to being. Uh, 
uh, too much uh, uh, linked to the um, to the foreign uh, to to the foreign uh, capital. And if I can make some uh, publicity advertising, we have at the OECD an initiative uh, uh, actually on good practices for debt management for low-income countries, and uh, we are very uh, proud to um, to support it. Thank you. Karen, if I may intervene very quickly on <clears throat> on, on comment, uh, I understand that China is a big problem, but but again, I think it's one that can can be anticipated in the sense that why do you need to incur the debt in the first problem? And and that, I think that has to do with poor debt management. Uh, the second issue is why uh, would a debtor agree to have governing law and jurisdiction uh, or of the lender, the lender being a sovereign, why would you give some collateral, uh, some assets or some cash flow as collateral that uh, defies uh, commercial logic? And again, this is uh, based on the ex ante measures that can be put in place to prevent that from the outset. So basically, yes, uh, China is a problem or some of the loans of, and, and I don't want just to single out China because I think that it goes beyond China. It's not just China. It's basically the non-traditional uh, Paris Club uh, bilateral lenders. And there the issue I think is, yes, it is a problem. And now we are focusing on, again, resolving how to deal with this, but we are not looking at the prevention, which has to do with greater transparency, better debt management uh, and capacity building. Because basically, I think that these are, and eventually, accountability if someone has acted beyond uh, their powers. And due process, can you uh, subject government X to, to the jurisdiction of government Y? And again, these are the things that I think that we can change a lot of this by working more on the ex ante rather than focusing now. Because I know the fire is now and basically you want to put off the fire, but if we do not tackle this from the outset, at some point there will be too many fires that we will not be able to cope with. And that was just the, the, the comment I wanted to make. Can I briefly ask, uh, just very briefly, because we're almost at the end of the session. Um, all of you have identified the private sector as being you know, needing to be there as a future part, as a future lender, like um, uh, public can't do it on its own. Um, at the same time, um, there's also been noted that there seem to be absent in this process that is currently going on. Uh, maybe Federico and uh, Gersomina, if you briefly, where are we with this? What, why are they not involved at this stage? And what role do they need? How, how are you going to change that? Well, I can go first if you want. I mean, there are, I think, uh, diverse uh, reasons. I mean, the, the debt profile of countries is very, is very different. I think that one interesting um, aspect that has been overlooked in the, um, in the discussions that led to the, the first uh, DSSI is that um, there is a local private sector that is uh, investing in, in government bonds or that is lending to, to governments in certain African countries that is uh, small, if you, if you look at it in international terms, but that has um, a stake in the fact that the governments uh, don't uh, default uh, or in any case they, they repay uh, their debt. And I think that this has created maybe some... some uh, tension or misperception within the pri private sectors between the big, large uh, international private sector uh, that negotiates with institutions like the G20 or the African Union, etc., and smaller, um, more fragmented banks in Africa, for example, that are heavily exposed to the domestic uh, debt market. So it's not answering exactly your question, but it's to say that when we talk about the private sector, I think that we should take into account that there is heterogeneity and what may seem small when compared to the big um, institutional investors or certain international banks is actually quite important in the in the in one uh, African economy. But let me also say that uh, staying on Africa, um, one of the aspects of this international dimension of the ex-ante framework that I was mentioning too, uh, 
uh, that maybe can be strengthened in the, in the discussion is that um, continental or regional institutions can play an important role here, I think. And uh, the African Union Commission and the Economic Commission for Africa are currently discussing some options for the use of the special drawing rights allocations uh, to create some kind of vehicles to guarantee uh, access of, of countries to international um, capital markets. And I mean, this is a, a part of the discussion we should be considering. Again, let me use these two seconds to make some advertisement as well. We will have a specific discussion uh, on the 9th of April, uh, together with uh, the head of the Economic Commission for Africa and with other uh, important players, exactly to discuss this topic. So how can we use this continental innovative uh, approach to, to, vehicle the, to use the SDR allocations? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, actually, on the private sector, on top of what uh, Federico said, I think that um, you know an important role uh, um, is played by the, the rating agencies. I mean, actually, what we heard, uh, um, you know, at the very beginning of the implementation of the DSSI, um, you know, we heard that actually uh, some uh, uh, countries uh, um, had um, reluctance to to ask for uh, the, the suspension because they fear to um, to get. Uh, uh, a lowering of uh, um, of their rating, and uh, so this is a uh, you know, and actually you know the dialogue uh, with the rating agencies, as others said, it's uh, it's very much uh, relevant. Uh, also, on the common framework, we see that uh, you know there could be a different attitude, and so you know this should be uh, clarified. Uh, and um, also another reason, I think, for the. Um, you know, uh, lack of participation is that um, um, there was a, maybe there is a the lack of a, a of a, also a, a coordination mechanism. The IIF actually is playing a role, and uh, the G20 involves the IIF, and actually also one of uh, the initiative which is important to remember is that uh, this uh, repository initiative on the data uh, on uh, on the on the private uh, debt to low income countries, which actually is, uh, it can add. Uh, it, it can add a lot of uh, um, to the uh, transparency, but uh, you know, in terms of incentives uh, on uh, this side, actually there wasn't uh, a good incentive for the private sector to participate there. And the reason why many countries uh, actually uh, are more reluctant to, to further extend the DSSI, but to push for the common framework is that because under the common framework, you know, the private sector should participate on a comparable terms with respect to the official creditors. So, you know, you introduce within the system also an incentive for the private creditors to uh, to come in. So, you know, in the end, it's always uh, an issue of uh, um, of incentives. But I said that at the very uh, beginning, you know, the DSSI was a, a, an emergency uh, measures, and um, actually, um, you know, not all uh, creditors. Uh, uh, we're able to join forces, uh, but uh, you know, going uh, forward with more structured solution, I think that uh, uh, we can achieve better result. Thanks very much, guys. Amina, we had a few more questions from the audience, but I, I'm afraid we're out of time. But as Rodrigo and pa uh, Paula said earlier, this is just the start of the initiative, so I'm pretty sure there'll be a few more. Um, discussions, debates, webinars coming, and hopefully we can revisit all of those there. I'll just hand over to Rodrigo for final words. Karin, thank you very much. Uh, I will do a very brief uh, closing remark and I'll give to Paola. Uh, I just want to thank you very much, uh, all participants for attending today. Special thanks to Jesolmina, Federico and Yanis for having read our papers, for discussing the paper. Uh, thank you, Karin, for moderating this. And big thank you to the OECD for co-hosting this event with us. Uh, since everybody is doing a little bit of marketing, I think I, I'm, I feel obliged to do a little bit of marketing, which is uh, we are very, very advanced on our second research output, which, which focuses on 
bilateral lending. And one of the things uh, uh, that we are trying to do in that paper, among others, is to try to draw a comparison between standard lending terms and some of the lending terms of this uh, new bilateral lending. So stay tuned. Uh, we will be hosting a, another event uh, soon where we will present that additional uh, research output. And with that, I hand over to Paola. Yeah, thank you, Rodrigo, and, and thank you um, to all of you and, uh, and the discussion. I think it was extremely rich, extremely interesting. What I take home with me is um, the point that uh, Yanis made about the preference for uh, hard currency uh, and for investing abroad than we experience, we see in many low-income countries. And, and, and also I like to pick what Gelsomina said about a successful debt management. Countries with a successful debt management means that actually they can rely on the domestic market because there is a domestic market. While some of the countries we're looking at, and again, I refer to what to the, some of the comments by Federico, do not have a domestic market. So it's, I think it is an interesting point for us to reflect in our ex ante work and uh, work on the ex ante conditions and structural conditions to use a Federico's world that will actually allow countries to be more resilient in their debt management. But I'd like to thank you again for this very stimulated initiative. And as Rodrigo said, remain tuned because there will be more, we hope. And certainly something next month about uh, our next paper. Thank you again very, uh, for your participation and uh, look forward to hearing from you and your comments. They also can, you can send it, you can get in touch with us with usual ways on email or whatever and send us your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to our audience. Thank you. Grazie. Bye. 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 Bye.